Good evening, Bahrain. I'm Bernadette from Gulf Brands International, and you're watching Wine Online Wednesday. We've now reached episode 14, and tonight it's Pinot Pinot, the Black Edition. So, of course, we're talking about the Pinot Noir, Pinot Nero grape. Now, there are quite a lot of Pinots out there. There's black grapes, there are white grapes. And the interesting thing is that the white grapes, which would usually be Pinot Grigio, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, they're all mutations of Pinot Noir. So everything started with Pinot Noir. Pinot Nero is the name typically given to it in Italy. And otherwise, it's much the same grape. So for tonight, we've got obviously three red wines, three Pinot Noirs. We've got a Pinot Noir from the Old World, from Italy from the Torti winery in Oltrebo Pavese, which is the north of Italy in the Lombardy region. And it's made from the, the Torti family, have been making wine now for three generations. This one is made by Dino Torti. Then we've got going all the way to California, where Pinot Noir has a fabulous cult following over there. This one is Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi. Again, a man with wine running through his veins. So that's a very passionate one. Then we're going to go around the world to New Zealand. And we come to the South Island of New Zealand and we have wine there made by an English cricket player. I kid you not. So Ian Botham. So quite a range of locations and styles and they're all the same grape. So I think we should, let's see what makes them all so special. So the Pinot Noir grape itself is about 3,000 years old. So it's probably one of the oldest grapes. It's about the 10th most planted in the world. And it's got a cult following around the world. It's, when it's good, it's very, very good. When it's not so good, it's a little bit disappointing. The grape itself is more expensive than other grapes. And it's also, the reason for that is it's a lot more difficult to grow and to get the best possible wine out of it. The home of Pinot Noir is Burgundy in France, and it still is considered the spiritual home. But there you find a range of Pinot Noir styles within the little microclimates, and given the small area of land and the high costs, it is unfortunately pretty expensive. So we're going to move out of France, and we're going to see where we can go in the rest of the world and come up with some lovely Pinot Noirs. So let's get straight into Italy. So. Torti, Dino Torti, Pinot Noir. Uh, as I said from Oltrebo Pavese, it's one of the biggest areas for growing wine in Italy. And they say that if you took the, the vine, the vineyards in Oltrebo Pavese, the vines are spaced one metre apart. I think you could call it social distancing in the vineyard. If you put them all in one line, it would go around the world once and a third. So that's an awful lot of wine. The area is, I think, just behind Chianti in terms of uh, land under vine. And in there, there's an awful lot of uh, local grapes grown, but it's considered the home of Pinot Noir in Italy. The climate is cooler. Uh, there's a lot of cool breezes there. And Pinot Noir itself likes a cooler climate. Hot summers, cool winters, and plenty of air circulating. That's, its, that's what it likes. So we have a look. So we can see a deep red, but opaque, but you can still see through the wine. We've got little brownish edges, just touches there. And let's see how it is on the nose. Ooh, typical cherries and strawberries. So torty started out, the founder uh, was about, it's just over 100 years old now, I think 1910 the winery was founded by Giovanni, uh, followed by his son Enrico, and now we have Dino, uh, the current uh, family scion in the winery. Uh, since Dino took over the winery, they've expanded their vineyards and done a lot of new developments in the winery. They're passionate about Pinot Nero. And the thing about Pinot Nero, it's got a long harvest, and especially for Torti, this is very particular for them because uh, from the earliest to the latest, the first pickings of Pinot Nero, they make sparkling wine. 
Then they also vinify a white wine, which is very unusual to do. You can also produce a rosé from Pinot Noir, and then you've got the red. So th the grapes are picked last for the red wines, so that they've developed a bit more fuller flavour. Cherries and strawberries, definitely. So let's see on the palate. Mm. 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 What you see is what you get. Follows through on the palate. Lots of black cherries, it just kind of glides. It's a very noble wine. And if you look back in the Middle Ages, in the uh, Pavese, in the ultra Pavese region, the noble families were the ones who were allowed to grow wine. Grow vines, sorry, make wine. Ah, oh, yeah, that's it's a classic Pinot Noir. It's got just the right juiciness, beautiful balance, and a lovely, elegant finish. This particular wine was awarded 91 points by James Suckling, and he had said that on the nose. Now there's fruits, and he said, a rose soap. You can imagine a soap scented of roses. So there's, it's beautiful. It's almost like a little feminine fra fragrance coming through. Yep, I can pick it up now that I've tasted the wine. Yeah, that's definitely coming through there. Yeah. Okay, so let's now move to California. And... Woodbridge by Robert Mondavi. So Mondavi himself, Robert Mondavi, in the 1900s, his parents Cesare and Rose emigrated from Italy uh, to the States, to Minnesota. And then in 1919, prohibition came in. Alcohol was banned. Being an Italian family, they were absolutely horrified. What is this? What's going on? You cannot live without wine. But there was a loophole in the law saying that you could make up to 200 gallons of wine for family consumption. So the Mandavis were rather enterprising. They discovered that there, there were grapes grown on the California coast and they set up a business shipping the grapes from California to the East Coast to, for Italian families to make wine. It got to the stage where they actually moved to California and young Robert went along with them. And his first exposure to the wine making was nailing crates of grapes in California and shipping them out east. Then in 1966, Robert Mondavi set up his own winery and he is the godfather of wine in California. In 1979, he decided to set up Woodbridge, which is under his influence, absolutely 100%. He's developed a more easier, easy drinking, easy to appreciate style. So let's see how it is. Okay, actually these wines are interesting this evening. Don't get them mixed up because they're practically all the same color. These two are practically the same, the Italian and the Californian. How are we on the nose? Strawberries and cherries again, definitely. Very signature but We've got a little, do we have a little, little hint of spiciness? Let's see if it's on the follow through. Yes, yes there is. I think there's a bit more oak coming through in this. So it gives you a little touch of savouriness, a little bit of spice. Um, the grapes for this are on, grown in the Lodi area of California, so it's on the coast. Again, it's got hot summer and cool winters and the breezes just keep the air circulating. This is perfect, perfect habitat for the Pinot Noir grape. Oh, yeah, this is very signature, yeah. Okay, now we're going to jump other side of the world and go to, and now for something completely different, New Zealand, Ian Botham. Okay, so let's get his wine here. Now, we've been talking about 
generations of family winemakers, the long history of, uh, of wine. And then we come to a relative newcomer. So who's Ian Botham? Ian Botham is an English bloke who plays cricket, or rather he used to. One of the best, probably the best player ever for England. Um, had a long successful career and was also knighted. So it's Sir Ian Botham, if you don't mind. Uh, he then had discovered he had a passion for wine and his first encounter with wine was, he tells a story that back when he was a little youngster running around the cricket pitches, I think he was about 17, he was carrying a basket for one of his mentors who would turn out to have huge influence on his career and in the basket was the Beaujolais some bread and cheese and this guy said to Ian, the young Ian, uh, so, do you like wine, son? And he said, no, I'm from Somerset, I drink cider. So, after a while, he was gradually introduced to wine, and it became a lifelong love for him. So, once his cricketing days were over, he decided he wanted to develop this passion even more. So, he got into winemaking in Australia. While he doesn't exactly own a winery, he works closely with the winemakers, with the growers, and has a range of Australian wines that he has developed. This is a very special wine. It's uh, actually called Limited Edition, as you can see on it. It's called the 78 series. And it's called the 78 because in 1978, it was his first tour of New Zealand, and that was where he got his first century. So it was a very important date in his career. And uh, it was a very it's a nice way to commemorate it. The wine itself, New Zealand has got two islands, North Island, South Island. The North Island is very well known for Marlborough, Sauvignon Blanc, which all over the world. The South Island, though, in central Otago, that is the most southernmost vine growing area in New Zealand and in the world. And again, we've got these contrasts of climate, of temperatures. So you've got hot summer and cold winter. Not just cold, freezing, snow on the ground winter. So the temperature can range from minus 10 to plus 30. Pinot Noir loves that kind of temperature, does very well there. So let's see how it looks. Now this is looking lighter. If we just have a quick comparison. Yeah, it's more transparent. We've got a lighter color going on here. And let's check out the nose. Mmm. Cherries, but they're um, a tart cherry. And plums. Not so much strawberries, more, more deeper fruit in going on in here. Um, and like sweet plum, not, a, not a, a young plum. This is a more ripened and a bit sweeter. Mm. Again, what you see is what you get very much coming through. Same flavours, there's some cherry, and there's the bit of the oaking, again this has had some oak as well, it's coming through in a long finish, but it's not spicy or mellow like the others. This is a bit more minerally, a bit more the after finish. And there's also a little herby uh, sensation of like thyme. When you, when you rub thyme, you'll get that little bit of um, grey-green herb. So, with three Pinot Noirs, to be honest, the, they are all signature of the Pinot Noir grape. And this accounts for why people love Pinot Noir all over the world, because you know that what you're going to get will be exactly as you want it. These lovely cherry notes, strawberries, 
and then depending how long the wine is aged or just a little bit more of the vinification style you might have a hint of toastiness on the end or you might have a little bit more of a herby style but absolutely delicious wine I think this this is wine is very food friendly um, I think the the Woodbridge would go well with uh, like a sundowner and some nibbles um, Torty, I think, can go with some nice meat dishes, maybe some lamb. And this one, yeah, I think it can go with more like um, a very gently cooked, a really nice piece of ribeye or meat. Not too many sauces or anything, just nicely grilled. I think it could go down well, yeah, definitely. So we've got three Pinot Noirs, um, all signature Pinot Noirs. But at the same time, we've got three characters making it. So we've got the original Italian grand nobile Don, Ferdino Torti. We've got the godfather of wine, Robert Mondavi. And we've got the trailblazer, Ian Bolton, who's uh, setting out in his second career of making wine. So, Pinot Pinot for tonight. Three personalities, three wines. Take your pick.